Welcome everyone to our webinar on private land conservation. My name is Jamila Hallinan and I'm the Head of Legal Education at the Environmental Defenders Office. My co-host tonight is Elise Broadfoot-Mills, she's our Education Solicitor. And I'm coming to you from Gadigal Land uh, in Sydney. I pay my respects to Gadigal, Gadigal Elders, past, present and emerging, and I extend those respects to the Elders on the lands that you're all coming from tonight. The purpose of this webinar is to introduce you to private land conservation. Landholders in Queensland have a number of options to choose from if they're interested in private conservation. And we're really lucky to be joined tonight by some of the providers of those options. Um, so I'm going to introduce you now. From Humane Society International, we have Helen Church. From the Department of Environment and Science, we have Robbie Burns. And from Land for Wildlife, we have Deborah Metters. I'd really like to thank our panellists for making the time to speak with us tonight. This webinar is part of our Defending the Unburnt collaboration with WWF, and we've got Michelle Ward, a conservation scientist from WWF, with us as well. And she's going to start us off tonight by telling us why it is so important to protect land that escapes the black summer bushfires. I should note up front that not all of the options that we're going to discuss tonight will be available in areas that have been impacted by the bushfires, but they are all capable of contributing meaningfully to the conservation of land and biodiversity. So we'll get started. Um, the first thing to note is that um, the content tonight is legal information and not advice. If you need further information or assistance, you can apply for that um, from the EDO um, through our website. So first up, we're going to hear from Michelle, who's going to tell us why WWF and EDO are working together to defend unburnt landscapes. Then I'm going to briefly outline what private conservation is, and then we're going to look at the various options that are available to Queensland landholders. There's going to be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to ask questions of our panellists. And you can do this by typing your question into the Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. You can do that at any time. Our panellists might answer your question in writing as we go. Otherwise, Elise will read out your questions at the end for our panellists to answer. So I'll hand over to Michelle. Thanks, Michelle, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, so yeah, why is it important to defend unburnt areas? So in the wake of Australia's 2019-2020 bushfires, the protection of unburnt habitat has become an urgent priority because when a fire burns through vegetation, it can remove really important things for animals like food. Um, fire can destroy hollows of trees that are used for nests. Um, it can also remove, you know, thick understory vegetation used for protection from invasive predators like cats and foxes. So much of the land that survived the bushfires um, that are intact are really important for surviving animals and plants. Um, so these six priority landscapes that you can see on the screen have been identified as requiring immediate protection because they will be key for surviving animals to use while impacted landscapes recover. Um, so in total, the six priority landscapes are home to about 62 plants and 21 animal species and 18 ecological communities listed as threatened under national environmental laws. Um, so some of these species include things like our spotted tail quoll, greater glider, grey-headed flying fox, koala, platypus, um, lyrebirds, all unique to Australia, found nowhere else in the world. Um, so much of these landscapes, interestingly, are privately owned. Um, so landholders will be in these areas will be absolutely key um, it, to ensuring these priority landscapes are protected and managed for biodiversity values. Um, and they're in a really unique position to contribute meaningfully um, to bushfire recovery. Can I get the next slide? Thank you. Um, so yeah, so Australia um, is probably, people probably already know this, but Australia is one of um, 17 mega diverse nations in the world, making our biodiversity internationally significant. Um, so especially the forests of that Eastern Australia are recognized as a global biodiversity hotspot. 
Um, unfortunately, Australia is also recognised as being a world leader in mammal extinctions um, and Eastern Australia is a deforestation hotspot when compared to other places across the globe like um, Brazil um, or Malaysia. Um, so these are, so they're in Australia, there are um, thousands of, of plants and animals and ecological, ecological communities that are at risk of extinction in the near future. Um, this is primarily driven by things like vegetation destruction, um, but it's also other stuff like invasive species and disease and inappropriate fire regimes. But the 2019, 2020 bushfires just exacerbated this problem. Um, so the bushfires have had, a devastating impact on our natural environments. Um, so significant ecosystems and, and landscapes were, were decimated, including places that are World Heritage listed, um, ancient rainforests that you know rarely, if ever, burn, um, and even things like waterways following the the, the, the flooding um, after the bushfires had huge impacts on our aquatic species. Um, so it's estimated that about 10 million hectares burnt um, and impacted about 173 different species. Of that, we estimate about 152 will never recover um, to pre-fire population sizes. Um, so while it is difficult to estimate that um, exact number of individual native animals that were impacted by the bushfires, that were, there were some estimates of around 3 billion nationally. Um, so in light of all this, it's really important to protect those intact, unburnt places while these other burnt areas recover. And that, that time can range. Um, some species, it would be, you know, the next few years. But for things like greater glider, that need those, um, the, the, the hollows of trees, for example, this can take hundreds of years. Um, so yeah, those intact unburnt areas are really important. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, that was a great overview. So now I would like to just provide a general overview of what we mean by private land conservation and some general things to consider. So private land conservation involves a landholder voluntarily agreeing to conserve some or all of their land for biodiversity. There are some programs that also focus in on cultural values as well, but they're, they're generally about biodiversity. And landholders can do this in one of two key ways. It could enter into some form of private conservation agreement with the provider, and that's probably the most common option, or they can register their property with a private conservation program without an agreement. <clears throat> so private land conservation agreements can be intended to last forever or for a set period of time. While the agreement's in place, the landholder is bound by the agreement and future owners of the land might also be bound depending on what the agreement says. Most agreements will restrict to some extent what can be done with the land. So they might put restrictions on clearing or on livestock grazing um, or developing land that has been set aside for conservation. And that way biodiversity values can be protected. Some agreements will also have management plans attached that will require the landholder to undertake certain activities, such as controlling pests and weeds. And in that way, the biodiversity values of the land can be increased over time. The landholder and the provider will negotiate the agreement and any management actions required, as well as any financial or other support that will be made available to the landholder. So landholders involved in private conservation are acting in the public interest, but they can bear the burden of doing that. Um, that's why the, the government and our non-government um, providers invest resources in programs that are aimed at delivering financial incentives and other support to encourage private land conservation. Who the agreement is made with will depend on the type of agreement. Some agreements will be made with the government, others will be made with um, a nonprofit organisation or an environmental NGO, um, such as Humane Society International. The landholder will continue to own the land and is responsible for complying with the agreement. And as I said before, some agreements will be registered on the title 
um, and will bind future landholders um, it, when the property is sold, um, that many will just um, be for a set period of time and only cover a set part of the land. So landholders might um, continue to operate their business, their farm, or anything else on the land that's not set aside for conservation. There are various options um, of private conservation available and choosing the right agreement or option will depend on your, your personal preferences and your circumstances. If you're seriously considering private land conservation, you might need to seek uh, legal advice, tax advice and financial advice. There's a lot to consider when choosing which private op conservation option to go with. And I've set out here some of the key considerations that landholders might wanna turn their minds to. The first is obviously the level of protection that is provided for the land. Uh, secondly, the level of support provided to you as the landholder. Most schemes will provide uh, educational and technical support, and some will provide financial um, support. In, and that could be in one-off grants or ongoing yearly payments, depending on, on the program. The duration of the agreement is also something to consider, and that goes to how legally protected the land, the land is. Um, so as I said, some agreements will bind you and future landholders, and others can be quite easily terminated by a current or a future landholder. It might be um, worth considering what the startup costs are. Um, these can be significant, often they're not. Um, it, they can, but the startup costs can include the costs of getting legal advice, financial advice, and maybe surveying the land to find out what, what the biodiversity values are that you're protecting. You should also consider any land management requirements. So these would be negotiated as part of the agreement and they're tailored to each property, but they typically include things like managing pests and weeds or fencing off um, certain areas to exclude stock. Um, you need to feel comfortable that you, you'll be able to carry out the management actions that you've agreed to. Lots of landholders will want to consider the potential impacts of private conservation on their property value. And the impacts that private conservation will have on property value will very, be very much determined um, by the, the circumstances. So it's impossible to sort of predict what they will be. Um, some purchasers might be willing to pay a premium for well-protected land. It really depends. Um, you shouldn't assume that it will necessarily um, reduce the value of your property though. It's just something that you'd need to look into. For legally binding agreements, you'll also need to think about enforcement. So if, the, if an agreement is legally binding, any breach of the agreement by a landholder might lead to enforcement action. And, and this can range from a warning letter right through to criminal prosecutions or civil enforcement in very serious cases. Um, Non-binding options are not legally enforceable against the landholder. And from our experience, providers tend to take a really collaborative and constructive approach to enforcement. So they tend to work with landholders to correct any breaches as opposed to taking a punitive approach to, to enforcement. All of this information is covered in a publication that we've prepared on private land conservation um, for landholders. It's available on our website and we're gonna provide you with a QR code at the end of the presentation. Um, that links to that publication on our website. Um, and it will just give you the opportunity to, to really investigate what each option is about and um, turn your mind to each of these, these questions um, for each option. So we're now going to take a look at uh, the options that are available to Queensland landholders. First up, we have nature refuges and special wildlife reserves. And to tell us all about those, we've got Robbie Burns from DES. So I'll hand you over to Robbie. Welcome, Robbie. Uh, Robbie. You're on mute. I'm not sure if you can hear me.
Robbie, are you there? I can see that he's here. Um, maybe I can skip us ahead to Land for Wildlife for now and we'll see if Robbie. Sorry, I am up. back. No problem. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. My, my video is on still. Yes. No, we can't see you. Oh, oh okay. I've got, oh, hang oh, on. I've got yeah. your video on, yeah. Robbie. I think we're all right to go. Okay, apologies for that. My network dropped out momentarily and I'm back online just in time. So thank you very much for having me, everybody. Yes, so my name is Robbie Burns and I manage the Private Protected Area Program in Queensland. Um, the Private Protected Area Program administers two classes of protected area under the Nature Conservation Act 1992. The first of those being nature refuges. Nature refuges have been around for about 20 years. We've got 553 of them across the state of Queensland at the moment, um, across quite a vast area, roughly 4.47 million hectares. Um, so quite, and, and quite geographically dispersed too. Um, we've got obvious concentrations in, in those areas in the southeast and also in the wet tropics, but all of our large pastoral holdings are in Western Queensland um, and predominantly in the channel country. So quite a diverse set of stakeholders too, um, from, sort of small tree change type folk, um, right through to significant corporate entities, uh, First Nations groups and um, large conservancies. Um, a nature refuge is a, is, is, a, is a class of protected area, as I said, um, which is underpinned by a legally binding conservation agreement. So the landholder enters into a voluntary arrangement with the state uh, through signing a conservation agreement, which is executed by the minister administering the Nature Conservation Act. Um, there's a range of criteria assigned to nature refuges, but in effect, we're just seeking to protect significant natural and cultural values across the landscape of Queensland. Um, so threatened species habitat, areas of regional ecosystems that are currently underrepresented within the existing protected area system, um, and, and a, a whole range of other criteria apply to nature refuges. Um, but effectively, it's a, it's a partnership arrangement. We're looking to partner with landholders in Queensland to, to achieve conservation outcomes. Um, and we support those landholders through a variety of mechanisms being technical advice provision. Um, we have an active contract at the moment with a third party supplier out there on ground doing property management plans, rolling out workshops and webinars for our landholder base. Um, but there's also access to financial assistance too. And there's two sort of uh, main streams for that financial assistance. One being sort of an ongoing annual small grants program that we offer to all of our nature refuge landholders across the state of Queensland. But also we offer um, a, a much larger um, financial assistance program that we call Nature Assist. Um, and Nature Assist is purely designed to attract new participants in the program um, and we're looking and, and, and the benchmark for Nature Assist is, is slightly different in that we are looking to move towards the 17% protected area coverage target established by Queensland government um, and so therefore area is quite a substantial criterion um, for when, we, when we're considering expressions of interest through the Nature Assist uh, stream. The most recent round of Nature Assist um, has now closed uh, and we're in the process of negotiating conservation agreements for nature refuges in various parts of the state, uh, which will certainly see a, quite a substantial, uh, some substantial additions to the protected area system. Um, as the slide indicates, um, that conservation agreement is signed in perpetuity. Uh, we do have a few historic conservation agreements that are still in the pipeline and are still being administered that are termed. Um, that was a previous program iteration and we're working hard to um, incentivize those landholders on termed agreements to come over to perpetual conservation agreements um, as part of our Nature Assist program. Um, it is legally binding and it is binding on successes and titles. So once that nature refuge sells, 
whomever takes on the property title after the original signatory has departed is now bound by that conservation agreement and all those management conditions that are assigned within that agreement. Um, I'll probably move on from there and move on to special wildlife reserves. So special wildlife reserves are a relatively new class of protected area. Um, one thing I didn't mention when we we're talking about nature refuges is that what, what the management principles for nature refuges, whilst it's in, inherent to take the landholders' interests into account, um, the pre the the the, the pre-existing state interests over that land, when we're talking leasehold land, which is primarily um, the, the the lion's share of the makeup of the private protected area network, um, they continue to exist. So mining is a threat for a nature refuge um, where there is a pre-existing forestry interest over parts of, of, of a nature refuge. Those rights and interests are retained by the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries um, and they can go in there and, and take out timber um, as a pre-existing state interest. We do work hard with our, uh, our colleagues in the Department of Resources and the Department of the, um, Agriculture and Fisheries to resolve competing state interests um, and, and, and escalating the role of conservation and, and uh, the, the equal consideration of conservation in those conversations. But the reality is, is that through the sheer mechanics of the law, those pre-existing interests remain. Um, and, and, and can compete uh, readily with the conservation outcomes that we're seeking to achieve through the Department of Environment and Science. So that's the reality when we're talking nature refuges. Um, so to bridge that gap in 2019, we introduced the bill to establish a new class of protected area known as a special wildlife reserve. A special wildlife reserve is in effect a private protected area that is afforded national park level protections on privately owned and managed land. Now, that comes with a great deal of management uh, requirement, of course. So when we assess for a special wildlife reserve, and I'll speak to the criterion for special wildlife reserves in a moment, not only do we assess the natural and cultural values um, contained on that particular property, but we also assess in, in a quite a level of scrutiny, the landholders capacity to manage that protected area in perpetuity to national park standard. Uh, so it's quite a significant, uh, uh, I suppose, point of difference from a nature refuge to a special wildlife reserve in that the landholders capacity in terms of their, their governance arrangements, their financial, um, credibility um, to manage those exceptional natural and cultural values into long term uh, uh, at the forefront of the uh, assessment process. Um, in short, the, the, the criterion for special wildlife reserves um, different to a nature refuge as written in law is that a nature refuge is designed to protect significant natural and cultural values. A special wildlife reserve is designed to protect exceptional uh, natural and cultural values. Um, we've defined exceptional and in a nutshell, um, without going into the into layers of detail, um, exceptional effectively means what does this property do for a specific value, a specific threatened species, a specific uh, regional ecosystem, a, a suite of regional ecosystems, for example, that no other property in Queensland can do. Um, and we've got some rather sophisticated um, strategic conservation analysis tools at our disposal to, to make those distinctions. Um, so when we talk special wildlife reserves, given it's a, they're afforded effectively national park level protections, mining is no longer a concern. So we, we must resolve ex pre-existing mining interests ahead of declaring a special wildlife reserve which is a process, it takes time sometimes um, ahead, of that, uh, ahead of that declaration. But once declared, no longer um, can a, a mining interest be applied for on that parcel of land. It's sterilized from mining interests. It's also sterilized from forest product interests, 
um, that's timber and quarrying. Um, and commercial grazing is not allowed on a special wildlife reserve. Um, if a particular uh, exceptional value requires some management intervention that may require grazing, we can consider that and condition for that within the Special Wildlife Reserves Management Program. Um, however, otherwise grazing is not permitted. On nature refuges, grazing is permitted. Sustainable grazing is permitted. Um, and in fact, um, the vast majority of our significant landholders that are involved in our Priority Protected Area Program the holders of nature refuges are pastoral companies um, that are balancing conservation with production. I might leave it there considering we've got a fair bit more to get through over the next half an hour, but happy to take questions um, through the chat or, or take them on notice and respond over the next day or so. Thank you, Robbie. That was a great overview of two really interesting options. Um, there, when I was doing research on private conservation options across our priority areas, um, there was nothing like a special wildlife reserve in either New South Wales or Victoria. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, level of protection that can be given to private land. Yep. Um, yes, and do put your questions in the chat if you have any questions for Robbie on either of those two options. I'm going to hand you over now to Deborah Metters, um, who's going to tell you about Land for Wildlife. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you, Jamila. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so I'm Deborah Metters. I'm self-employed, and my business, Second Nature Environmental Services, is contracted by 14 local governments in southeast Queensland to deliver regional coordination services of the Land for Wildlife program. So tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, two different programs, uh, firstly Land for Wildlife and then secondly Voluntary Conservation Covenants. So tonight I'm calling in from my home office in Jugara country, um, I live near Ipswich in southeast Queensland. So both of those programs, Land for Wildlife and Voluntary Conservation Covenants are delivered by local governments. Um, so Land for Wildlife is a free and non-binding program. So unlike the two programs that Robbie just talked about, Land for Wildlife means that someone can leave the program at any time. Although this is possible, we find that most Land for Wildlife members uh, choose to stay with the program and that when many Land for Wildlife properties get sold, the new owners decide to also join the program and continue the conservation work of the previous owners. So the program's been running in Southeast Queensland since 1998, and we have um, over 5,300 properties involved in the program and um, about 250 new properties join the program annually. So we have certainly hundreds of members that have been with the program for over 20 years. So in addition to the classic sort of rural lifestyle properties, there's also involved in Land for Wildlife or Land for Wildlife members are uh, schools and some government uh, land holdings, uh, golf courses, lots of primary producers, vineyards, um, and many other different sorts of land holdings within the program. So to be eligible to join Land for Wildlife, you need a property that has at least one hectare of good quality native vegetation. And for Brisbane and Logan, that size drops to 0.5 of a hectare. Might go to the next slide, please. Great, thanks. So there's many benefits and I'd argue no downsides to joining Land for Wildlife. Every new Land for Wildlife property is visited by a local government officer who will walk around your property with you, ask you about your property goals and your challenges. They'll chat with you about the natural values of the property, uh, what wildlife is there, what the ecosystems are there, and will provide management recommendations um, such as what are your priority weeds and how to control them. After that visit, you'll be sent a management plan about uh, that outlines basically what dis was discussed at that property visit and also lots of background information. So if you've got threatened species or other things like that on your property. We provide also lots of property maps to help with that management planning. And you can see on screen, they're just an example of our management plan where we sort of divvy up the a property into various management zones just to help with prioritization and management targets. 
member of Land for Wildlife, you get invited to workshops and field days and to see what other landholders are doing also on their properties and also to connect with experts in their fields. Most councils offer incentives to Land for Wildlife members, such as access to free native plants, nest boxes and weed control tools. Most councils also offer grants to Land for Wildlife members and in some councils this is a significant amount of money annually and this is for undertaking conservation work such as fencing off uh, the creek for stock, um, doing weed control or surveying for threatened species. So Land for Wildlife is not only about wildlife, it's about the people. So through Land for Wildlife, Land for Wild, uh, members can connect with other landholders that are also doing conservation work. They can connect with researchers who might be studying wildlife like koalas or greater gliders or microbats or a rare plant. And it's an opportunity for people to connect the broader work of kind of like-minded landholders. As a Land for Wildlife member, you can phone your Land for Wildlife officer at any time. You can request a property revisit. You'll also receive regular newsletters and invites to join projects or other events. So it's a very active program it is. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the second program I wanted to talk about tonight is called Voluntary Conservation Covenants. So these are delivered by only nine local governments in southeast Queensland. And similar to the Nature Refuge program that Robbie um, spoke about, voluntary conservation covenants are binding on the title of the property. So the conditions of the covenant bind successive owners. Um, covenants are considered an encumbrance to the property, but we've found that if they are negotiated well, uh, there should be little to no impacts on the land value. Um, so each covenant is individually negotiated between the landholder and local government to make sure that we get that balance right and that there aren't any uh, future concerns that um, you might fall into. So all the establishment costs of the VCA that Jamila um, spoke to earlier on, um, such as survey and legal costs, are all paid for by the local government. So it is free for landholders to join or enter into a voluntary conservation covenant. So similar to Nature Refuges, uh, to be eligible to join a voluntary conservation covenant program, your property does need to have a high conservation values, such as threatened species or a connection to a national park or a local council reserve. Um, there are also um, some councils will definitely consider a property that has been restored by the landholders uh, to enter into a covenant. So there's landholders that I know of on, a, on the Sunshine Coast, they planted over 30,000 trees on their property and basically recreated the rainforest that was once there. Uh, they were eligible to join the VCC program to protect and secure their investment that they'd made into that property. So all voluntary conservation covenant properties in Southeast Queensland first started out as land for wildlife. So Land for Wildlife acts kind of as a stepping stone uh, to covenants if a landholder wants to go down that path. Um, so all covenanted landholders receive all the benefits of Land for Wildlife, um, in addition to a few other things that I'll just go and talk about as well. So currently in South East Queensland, there's about 100 uh, voluntary conservation covenant properties in South East Queensland. I'll jump to the final slide, please. Thanks. So in addition to those benefits I outlined about Land for Wildlife, which are all there for Voluntary Conservation Covenant landholders, uh, VCC properties um, also receive a rate rebate. So this varies from council to council and is generally only applied to that covenanted portion of the land. So for example, uh, both City of Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast councils offer up to a 95% rate rebate if 90% of the property is covenanted. So most councils also offer specific funding uh, annually for their voluntary conservation covenant members because they recognise that it's a big step to take up a covenant. And that is always to help them implement the goals of that management plan that was developed when they you know, first joined Land for Wildlife and then was subsequently uh, revised and updated um, with more property visits. So, for example, City of Gold Coast offers up to $7,000 annually and Sunshine Coast Council offers up to $7,500 annually towards funding on-ground actions such as weed control, fencing, fire management or erosion control. 
So the Voluntary Conservation Covenant members are also entitled to access the other grants that I spoke about on top of this for conservation works. So with regards to the theme of tonight's webinar, you know, protecting the unburned, uh, both the Land for Wildlife and Voluntary Conservation Covenant programs encourage and support members to do fire management planning for their properties. This also includes doing controlled ecological burns to encourage natural regeneration and to maintain the health of open eucalypt forests. It also helps prevent, you know, those devastating bushfires that we all uh, saw and experienced um, two years ago, of which some Land for Wildlife properties um, were affected here in southeast Queensland. So many councils um, are working with local Indigenous fire practitioners to reinstate Indigenous fire management, um, to help keep our ecosystems healthy and to build more resilience to um, these extreme weather events such as bushfires and floods. So it's a really positive thing that if, if there's anything positive that came out of the bushfires, that's one of them in southeast Queensland. Um, so as Jamila said, these programs act in the public good um, with, the extend, with the benefits extending well beyond the, the, um, the fence of that property. So weed control, erosion control, um, having health ecosystems not only affects you know, the broader community, but properties nearby and certainly those in the downstream catchment areas. Very happy to, that's it for me tonight. I'm very happy to take any questions. Uh, feel free to visit the Land for Wildlife website. Uh, there you can read lots of case studies about both Land for Wildlife members and Voluntary Conservation Covenanted members, uh, what's been their experiences with the programs. Um, and there's also lots of resources to download. So uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight and I, I hope that was beneficial. Cheers. Uh, it was beneficial, Deborah. Thank you. There was so much interesting information in there. I really like the idea of, um, of the stepping stones, you know, how you could dip your toe um, with Land for Wildlife, non-binding, and then move up the, the levels, at, you know, as you gain confidence and um, more certainty about what you want to do on your property. Um, another good way to dip your toe is through Wildlife Land Trust. And to tell us all about that is Helen Church from Humane Society International. So welcome, Helen. Thanks so much, Jim. And uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Helen and I manage the Wildlife Land Trust, which is um, Humane Society International's private land conservation program. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of us, Humane Society International is a conservation and animal welfare charity. And the Wildlife Land Trust is just one of our many uh, programs designed to protect wildlife and their habitat throughout Australia. Um, our program is mainly focused on inclusivity. So we have agreements that are very flexible and also non-binding. And our program is completely free to our members. Um, at the moment, we have just over 820 members throughout Australia. Um, and these can range from one hectare to several thousand hectares. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so who can join, who is eligible? We do welcome mixed use sanctuaries. So um, a lot of our members are farmers who are managing their land sustainably, uh, wildlife carers, we have ecotourism operators. We even have a few monasteries. Uh, basically, if you're managing your land for the benefit of wildlife and their habitat in your area, um, you're more than welcome to sign up. Uh, our membership isn't legally binding, so uh, agreements, you can opt out of them at any time, um, and they don't carry any sort of legal obligations. If you do choose to sell your property, it's a very simple process to transfer that membership onto the new owners, which um, most new owners are perfectly happy to do. Um, and our agreements do complement any other conservation programs, including all of the ones you've heard tonight. Um, we can also help you explore options once you've signed up on uh, any other programs that you'd like to uh, be a part of or explore. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why should you join the Wildlife Land Trust? Our main uh, aim of this program is to create this network of wildlife friendly landholders. So once you sign up, you become part of this wildlife friendly community. Uh, you can connect with other landholders, um, share your stories and learn more about wildlife and habitat and how to conserve them in your area. Um, you'll also receive a property sign. 
Um, this is a really good way to connect with your neighbors, have that conversation about private land conservation and sort of connect up and create these beautiful corridors of, of habitat for wildlife. Um, we do have a few ecologists on hand, which can help out with any conservation advice as well as support. Um, this can be for issues on your land as well as within your local community. So any conservation problems you might have, uh, we can give you a little bit of support and advice for that. And we also do occasionally have grants available. Uh, these include Humane Society International Disaster Response Grants, uh, as well as a few others that tend to come up uh, yeah, just on occasion. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so within the Wildlife Land Trust, there are a few programs that we run to uh, support our members and their conservation efforts. The first one is our sanctuaries for sale, uh, exactly what it says on the tin. We can advertise your property that is for sale to any buyers who might be like-minded and have more of a conservation lead. Um, with this, you can advertise your property to the people that might appreciate the natural values a bit more, and um, you can carry on your conservation work as well. Uh, we also have our Sanctuaries You Can Stay program. Uh, this is a very successful program where we promote any eco-friendly tourism or accommodation uh, on your property to our supporters. Um, it's been very popular for our members to, you know, have this extra income and this eco-friendly business on their land. And it's also really great if you're looking to travel within Australia. Um, do recommend it. You can support local businesses, local uh, habitat and wildlife programs, and you can get involved in some bush regeneration or wildlife spotting tours. Uh, lots of great stuff there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, we do hope to hear from you. Uh, in conclusion, this is a really good option for anyone, uh, as Jem said, to dip your toes in. It's uh, you know, a great way to have a first step into private land conservation without having to worry about legal obligations or costs. Um, and it's also great for people that might not be eligible for uh, more permanent programs. Um, signing up is very easy. You can visit our website and fill in the form there or email me. Um, and I do recommend that you check out our website if you wanna learn more, there's plenty of information there. Um, or you can ask in the chat right here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Helen. I am very tempted by that century you can stay picture, I have to say. Okay, um, that's it for our panelists. I have one more option to talk about, um, but we don't have the provider here because it's the Australian government. It's Indigenous protected areas. Um, and so IPA is an area of land or sea country that traditional owners have voluntarily agreed to manage for conservation. And as I just said, the agreement is made with the Australian government. They are accompanied by a plan of management, which sets out how country, um, its natural and its cultural values and any threats to those values will be managed. The management plan will be negotiated between the traditional owners and the government, and they're tailored to the particular country that they apply to. Once declared, an IPA forms part of Australia's national reserve system, and it contributes to um, biodiversity conservation, and it makes a significant contribution. I think a, a large part of our protected area estate um, <clears throat> is made up of IPAs. These um, Agreements also help Indigenous communities to protect the cultural values of their, of their land for uh, future generations. And studies have shown that they can also result in significant health, education, economic and social benefits. Um, the duration really depends on, on what the agreement says and will be set out in the agreement. So they might be intended to last a set period of time. Um, in terms of land eligibility criteria, um, they can apply to land or sea. <clears throat> they can also apply to a range of land tenures. So they can include national parks, uh, local government reserves, private land and native title lands um, and lands that are under co-management agreements. 
There is support available. IPA pro, um, projects are supported through multi-year funding agreements. Many Indigenous organisations also supplement this funding through fee-for-service or other income-generating activities such as tours. Um, and they can also tap into private sector and philanthropic organisational support. The IPA framework actually encourages traditional owners to enter into partnerships um, with conservation and commercial organisations to provide employment, education and training opportunities um, for Indigenous people. There's no application process as such. The agreements are just negotiated between the traditional custodians and the government. And that happens through the National Indigenous Australians Agency. But before an IPA can be declared, um, a, a fair amount of community consultation needs to take place and a plan of management needs to be prepared. The Australian government can support traditional custodians um, to, to step through that process in terms of consultation and the, pre the preparation of a plan of management. So traditional custodians who are interested in entering into an IPA should um, seek independent legal advice before doing so. Um, and to support them through the process. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Elise. One more thing before we move on to questions um, is where EDO and WWF um, will soon be publishing a guide to the carbon market for private landholders. So we looked into the carbon market as the possible alternative pathway for private landholders to benefit from protecting unburnt trees on their land. However, once we took a close look, we realised there are really limited opportunities um, in, in the carbon market for protecting uh, vegetation that is intact. And that's because simply having unburnt forest on your land is not enough to meet the requirements um, of carbon markets. Um, particularly if the current management of the land uh, would see the, the vegetation retained in the landscape. Having said that, this guide will provide an overview of both the regulated national carbon market and the domestic and international voluntary carbon market, as well as possible opportunities for projects that deliver both carbon and biodiversity benefits. And it will set out information, um, a guidance on where you can go for more information. So keep an eye out for that. In terms of where you'll find it, um, we have a page on our website that's dedicated to our defending the unburnt work. You will be able to access that by following the QR code on your screen. Um, the guide to private land conservation is published there, which covers all the information that we've discussed tonight. So you can go back and read it at your leisure. Um, I'll give you a bit of time just to follow that QR code. Um, in the meantime, we can move on to questions. Um, Elise, do we have any questions in the chat? Yes, we've got plenty coming in the chat. Um, okay. I might start, and, and thank you to the panelists who've sort of been answering these as we go, but I might read a couple out um, just so people that haven't been able to follow along the chat get the benefit. Um, I've had a few questions about overlapping agreements, um, sort of whether you can get support or funding from various agreements. Um, and I'll probably direct this question to everyone just to hear how your programs overlap. But I might start with Helen, um, because I know that's sort of a key benefit of your program um, in how you can how you can work with people that maybe have sort of other conservation agreements going on. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. So we design our agreements um, to work perfectly with any other conservation agreement you might have on your land. And we can also help anyone who signs up to pursue, uh, you know, stepping up their protection on their land or um, accessing any other sort of agreement. Um, so we can help you out with any sort of guide guidance that you need for that or any extra information. Um, but yeah, that's not a problem at all. That's awesome, thank you. Um, I might direct the question then to Deborah as well, because I see in the chat that you've said that your programs are able to overlap as well. I hadn't realized that, so that's, um, can you tell me, yeah, how that works? Yeah, of course. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely land, for, or there's definitely properties in Southeast Queensland that have 
that are land for wildlife, have a voluntary conservation covenant and have a nature refuge agreement all on the same property. Uh, arguably an overkill having two covenants, but because they're uh, enabled under two different pieces of Queensland legislation, it can happen. So I guess that is, you know, the best form of protection available um, at a both, a, both a local government and a state government level. Obviously, there's not a lot of those, um, but it is possible. Some other local governments, rather than bearing the costs of entering into a voluntary conservation covenant, um, they pre-recognise nature refuges that already exist. So they offer those properties uh, the rate rebates as though they would have a voluntary conservation covenant. Um, but all of those properties are also in Land for Wildlife as well. So Land for Wildlife is really that entry level program. And then a lot of other programs sit on top of that. And the HSI one would sit very nicely on top of that as well. Uh, we do have an Indigenous protected area in southeast Queensland down on the Gold Coast and it's a wildlife property. So there's an example of just, you know, even a federal program overlaps nicely with a local government program as well. Thanks. Yeah, that's fantastic. And yeah, as you pointed out, such a great way to sort of have that stepping stone to get people really comfortable in learning how to how to manage their land. Um, I mean, that sort of answered um, for you as well, Robbie, but I might just ask out of interest, uh, do special wildlife reserves have, you know, can they be overlapped as well? Or is that kind of a standalone program in that sense? Technically, they could, but I wouldn't assume that would ever be the case. Special wildlife reserves are, are, are exceedingly higher level of protection than any of those others discussed uh, this evening. So um, I couldn't see there being a, a real compatibility with, with those other classes of um, uh, of private land conservation available in Queensland. Um, but yeah, certainly just going back to what Deborah touched upon, um, we we readily accept and, and um, encourage there to be uh, cross-pollination between local government programs and the state programs, um, particularly given that it provides a, a couple of streams for potential uh, income. Um, or financial assistance that will then, of course, be turned into um, management outcomes on those private protected areas. So we certainly enable that wherever we can. Um, one of the chief considerations for local governments is a voluntary conservation covenant under the Land Act requires a survey to be undertaken, um, which is at an expense. Um, hence why I, I think, as Deborah mentioned earlier, um, a number of local governments are quite prepared to acknowledge nature refuges um, within their voluntary cons conservation covenant programs um, without going down that pathway of having to survey and administer a Land Act covenant. Um, same outcome in terms of conservation outcome and conservation gain um, without having to bear that expense of a survey, which is not a requirement of a nature refuge. Yeah, okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, I'll just quickly mention, I've changed the slide over. We have another QR code here. Um, if you're minded while we're talking through some questions, um, we've just got a little sort of survey here um, just to evaluate the webinar. It really helps us um, prepare webinars that are helpful to you all. Um, I have another question for you, Robbie. Um, again, it's one thank you for answering in the chat, but I thought other people... Um, might benefit from hearing. So just about how you apply to Nature Assist and you sort of mentioned that this might have closed for the year, but is this something that comes up again in the future? Can people keep an eye out for this? Yeah, absolutely. So the round that's just closed was, was round nine. Um, so we've been running rounds of Nature Assist since 2007. Um, and through Nature Assist, we've acquitted nearly $16 million in incentives funding to establishing new private protected areas in Queensland. So it is an ongoing program that's well supported by government. Um, it's spoken to in Queensland's protected area strategy, which is an underpinning strategy, you know, informing the future strategic direction of, of um, expansion and also um, management of protected areas in Queensland. So it's certainly something that, that government supports. Um, in terms of this current round, um, we obviously now need to get on and deliver these projects on these private protected areas, and that's going to be, you know, highly resource intensive for the team. Um, so we'll now be focusing upon delivering those projects on those new private protected areas um, through the Nature Assist program, um, and that will wrap up in terms of the funding cycle at the end of the 23-24 financial year, after which we'll then see 
more funding through government and roll out another round beyond that. But um, in the meantime, we certainly still are open to receiving inquiries about non-funded nature refuges, if that's something that the um, audience here this evening is interested in. Um, and I did put the um, the email address in one of those uh, responses to a, to a question earlier, but it's effectively just nature refuge or one word um, at desdes.qld.gov.au. Um, and if you're interested in the program, um, we also have quite a bit of information on the um, on the DES website as well around the Private Protected Area Program and um, a bit more detailed information with respect to the eligibility, eligibility criteria for those two classes of protected area mentioned. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and I might use this opportunity as segue to sprig the guide that Jen mentioned earlier. So all the information, um, well, all the basic information about um, these agreements have been written down in a guide for private landholders, which we've got on our website. And in that, we've got some links to those government websites as well, um, to some of the NGO websites. So you can either find it in the chat where Robbie's put it or um, in that guide as well. Um, for me, something that's really come out of doing this work um, is just proving sort of how powerful it is to get all these landholders together, um, how important it is to not just have sort of public land managed, but to have this private conversa convers conservation. Um, it really, yeah, it's really, really important to protecting our biodiversity in Australia. Um, and we've seen a few sort of of these smaller private landholder groups come together. Um, and I saw Deborah mentioned one in the chat here, um, like a little success story from Toowoomba. And I thought it'd be great if you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, sure, thank you. Uh, because I realize that my talk is all about Southeast Queensland and that's really the 14 local governments that are involved. And you know, if you're lucky enough to live here, then you do get um, reasonable levels of support if you want to enter into a private land conservation program. Um, but outside of that, um, it does fall away very quickly. Um, and so I acknowledge that. And really that's where the state government starts to pick up things um, and maybe the regional and our own bodies to some degree. Um, so Toowoomba Regional Council, just really quickly, uh, they were in Land for Wildlife or they delivered the Land for Wildlife pro program, I should say. And then for various reasons, um, usually around, I think it was around the council amalgamation process about a decade ago in Queensland, uh, they decided to cease delivery of the program. So the Land for Wildlife members that were in that area uh, uh, created a Friends of Land for Wildlife group and lobbied council um, to uh, reinstate Land for Wildlife um, and put it in, within their environment policy. And, um, and basically Toowoomba Council has agreed to reinstate a four year pilot program. And really that's focusing on uh, building that community uh, network again. So those workshops, field days, information sharing, um, delivering incentives, all those things that the Land for Wildlife program do that's about the social networks. It's not just about you know, the conservation, but are really building those social networks. So it is a great news story from Toowoomba uh, required those people to, you know, coalesce together and to um, to do the hard work um, in lobbying council, but um, it paid off and um, yeah, hats off to them, that's for sure. Cheers. Yeah, it's a really exciting story to hear. Um, and I might bring up sort of rate rebates while we're on this topic because someone's asked, um, yeah, if councils can sort of offer those subsidies and um, Robbie said that some councils do, which is fantastic. Um, but we've seen in Victoria, some landholders got together and sort of are working on lobbying their councils and their government to offer rate rebates. Um, yeah, and I think that's a really fantastic thing to think about if you get this growing community um, through any of these NGOs, through these conservation agreements. It's a fantastic thing to sort of support each other and see how you can build these benefits in. Um, I'll ask a few more to finish us off. Um, Helen, there was a question about whether sanctuaries you can stay is just in Queensland. Are you able to answer that for us? Uh, yeah, no, we have it uh, all across Australia. I think there's uh, definitely at least five in every state um, all across the place. And they're always in some beautiful natural areas uh, surrounded by hikes and kayaking and things like that. Um, so, yeah, available in any way you'd like to travel, really, in Australia. And I assume that's the same for the um, property selling list as well? That's right, yeah. Fantastic. Um, 
I think we might have covered most. Oh, I could, we might just finish with one more question. Um, Deborah, I might start with you if that's all right. So we had a question about um, someone a bit worried that their sort of property is maybe a bit isolated and doesn't connect enough to sort of other ecosystems. Now, Ruby, you've said that um, connectivity is a criteria for nature refuge, but Deborah, is there maybe a, a lower threshold um, something in land for wildlife that could work if your property's not so connected to other areas of biodiversity? Yeah, look, I, I think again, it's um, for wildlife in Southeast Queensland is great, but if you're um, in other parts, I think that question was west of the Great Divide, um, you know, th there is definitely a gap in the marketplace, in the marketplace, you know, for private land conservation. And I'm definitely the first to admit that. And it would be great to see more programs delivered uh, with that stewardship payments or kind of really diverse things that are happening, not only in other states, but also national, uh, internationally sort of in the private land conservation space. So I think it's a growing industry, private land conservation. So um, even if something's not available now, we work towards building it for the future. With regards to if you are an SEQ and your property is too small to join Land for Wildlife or it's not, uh, hasn't got uh, enough uh, ecological values on it, uh, certainly most, there's a lot of other groups, networks, land care groups, um, pollinator networks that do provide um, opportunities to um, provide information and resources and support to some of those properties. All of Land for Wildlife resources are online. Um, a lot of Land for Wildlife officers will take a phone call, you know, at least. Um, so there's support available um, is what I'd say, but it may not be, you know, 100% what people need if you're on basically a very small property. Mm -hmm. um, some councils definitely offer backyards for wildlife programs, um, but that's, um, yeah, not every council. Thanks. Thank you. And Helen, I might pose that to you as well as if there's kind of a, that lack of connectivity, is that any barrier to joining your program? Um, it isn't actually. Uh, Wildlife Land Trust is very much based on a property per property basis. So if your land is being managed for the benefit of, of species, both common and rare, um, you're more than welcome to join. We see it as a nice little island of biodiversity in some places, you know, that's that's desperately needed for wildlife. So um, it, it does factor into the criteria, but it certainly isn't a barrier to joining the Wildlife Land Trust. Yeah, I might clarify too, that's certainly the case for the Nature Refuge Program as well. Um, it's a criteria, of course, um, but if a property supports a, a regional ecosystem that has no represented, re representation in the, in the existing protected area system, then that, of course, is a value worthwhile considering for addition. Um, so it's certainly something that we consider when considering the overall scope of values um, pre present on a property um, and how that, that property might um, integrate into the, the wider landscape, um, but it's not a barrier to, um, to participation. Yeah, I think that's um, maybe a really good point to end on because what it sounds oh, like for me. Oh, sorry, yes, Jim. Lise, can I jump in? Sorry, there was just a couple of questions that I saw that yeah, I wouldn't yeah, sure. mind touching on. Um, one person asked about um, whether these sorts of programs are available in other states. And I know Helen's program definitely is. Um, and uh, that, that's a national program, um, isn't it, Helen? Yes, that's right. Anyone in Australia. And, um, and Land for Wildlife is also available uh, in Victoria and New South Wales. Slightly different, um, but pretty much the same thing. Uh, that's correct, isn't it, Deborah? Uh, yes. Yeah. And um, and yes, in New South Wales and and Victoria both have their own private conservation options that are, are particular to them. Um, they vary a little bit. Someone in the chat mentioned um, New South Wales having a, co a sort of government coordinating body called the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, and they administer a number of our private conservation options, including offsetting options. Um, and they, they have a fund that they, from, from which they can um, deliver grants to participating landholders. And when it comes to offsetting, well, the, the landholders are essentially uh, funding themselves through selling credits. Um, there isn't a, a, 
New South Wales also supports, you know, all the non-government um, options as well. Um, there was a question around whether uh, it was it would be good to have such a thing in Queensland, like a, a government coordinating body. Uh, does anyone want to tackle that? Well, I can certainly speak to um, the the BCT and. Well, we're, we're certainly very aware of what's happening across jurisdictions. Um, we're, we're very uh, embedded in that conversation. Um, we met with the Australian Land Conservation Alliance, which is another organisation that I suggest your audience um, that are interested in private land conservation look into. They hold an annual uh, private land conservation conference, um, which would be probably beneficial um, to those that are interested in, in, in having a look at. Um, but yes, you know the Biodiversity Conservation Trust is a is a very different model to what we deliver here in Queensland. Um, it's it, but basically for us the challenge in terms of delivering a full scale stewardship based model in the current um, climate is that we have quite a substantial existing landholder base, and if you're going to roll out a stewardship based program, you have to roll it out equitably across those that you wanted to attract to the program, but also offer that same level of assistance to your existing landholder base. Um, and that becomes quite costly. So we're in the process now, we've, we've recently engaged Australian National University and Frontier Economics to do some work in looking at the current program delivery model and, and looking at alternate models for delivery um, and looking at things like the VC2 uh, to come up with a few options that um, come the end of our current budget cycle, we'll be able to build a case uh, for how we might look to take this program um, going forward. And there's a number of um, other uh, current pro projects that we're rolling out that will also inform that future pro program direction. Um, a number of them are actions under that Queensland Protected Area Strategy, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we're looking at third party supplier arrangements with delivering aspects of our landholder services, et cetera. Um, so yeah, try, trying to sort of explore all the tools in the toolbox. We've also got a much closer um, collaboration underway with the likes of the Land Restoration Fund here in Queensland, which is a, a carbon farming pro program run by the, by the Queensland government. Um, and we're also in um, very close dialogue with our colleagues in the Offsets Fund and looking for opportunities to tap into some of that substantial bucket of money to incentivise uptake, but also to service our existing landholder base too. Um, so we do have similar frameworks. Um, it's just a case of what is the best fit for Queensland. Good answer, thank you. There's also a question, are there plans to incentivise more large areas in the agricultural landscape in Queensland for private conservation? And a sort of related question, is there a role for regional NRM bodies in this space? Does anyone wanna have a go at that? Yeah, certainly, um, you know, it depends on what sort of ag we're talking about. Um, but certainly if it's, if it's, if it's primary production um, in terms of grazing enterprise, then we, we, we deal with um, large stakeholders across the state of Queensland that are uh, balancing conservation with, with production. So that's certainly something that is very compatible. Um, obviously we're not going to be looking to put a, uh, a nature refuge over an area of, um, highly modified cropping land, for example, but certainly if we're talking, um, you know, uh, land uses akin to, to, um, cattle grazing, um, not so much sheep or, 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 or goats, uh, I must admit, we, we have a slight aversion to, to that at times, but we, you know, retain an open mind. Um, and then in terms of the NRM groups, um, yes, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, one of the, um, the projects we're rolling out at the moment is we've engaged a third party supplier to deliver a suite of products and services to our existing nature refuge landholders. Um, and that's in partnership with NRM Regions Queensland. Um, so there's six NRM regional groups engaged in that project um, across the state. So um, very much, um, yeah, utilising the NRM groups and their existing networks, um, their existing memberships um, to, to maximise the reach for those programs. Yeah, I think a real key takeaway for me from these questions is that it's worth just sort of 
reaching out to everyone if you think that your land could be covered or if you're interested in this I think it's worth having a chat with people and you know getting someone out on your site to sort of have a look around and see see what you qualify I think it's absolutely worth sort of telling your neighbors about as well and and definitely getting involved where you can um yeah and there's been a few questions on on carbon credits co-benefits um, with biodiversity and biodiversity credits. Um, the carbon credit stuff will be covered in our upcoming report, which will be published on our website. It will have all the information you need to get started and start uh, learning about carbon credits in Australia, carbon farming. Um, biodiversity credits are a different beast, but I think lots of governments are looking into the co-benefit of biodiversity and carbon together. Um, so this is an emerging uh, opportunity in Australia. Um, so I'd say watch this space, but we'll be publishing that report really soon on our website. Um, you should be able to uh, find it by uh, following the link that we provided earlier or just searching for carbon credits um, on our website. Um, but yeah, it's just not ready yet. I'm sorry. Elise, is there anything we need to do any more questions or? Um, well, I think I might end with one final question, which is where do I go to get started? And I will just say again, um, the yeah, the, the guide, I might provide the link again for the guide, which is this QR code here. Um, and this will give you links to everyone that's spoken tonight, um, you know, their home pages, so you can read more about it and see if it's going to be beneficial and fit your land. Um, but I think that is all the questions and thank you so much everyone for putting your questions in the chat it really yeah it's really great to to get everything out of the panel here um and thank you as well to our panelists for joining tonight we really appreciate your expertise and yeah your experience in the area um and i know everyone on the line has really appreciated that so thanks everyone for joining and enjoy the rest of your evening thank you elise thank, thank you everyone Anna. thank you everybody